Welcome back to the Health Longevity Secret Show, and I'm your host, Dr. Robert Lufkin. It used to be that brushing your teeth was just to help prevent cavities. Now we are learning that oral disease is an independent risk factor for stroke, heart attack, and yes, Alzheimer's disease. Let's find out why. Charles Whitney, MD, is double board certified in family medicine and sports medicine. He served seven years as a U.S. Air Force physician and six years in the University of Pennsylvania Health System. Dr. Whitney founded Revolutionary Health Services in 2004. He has been a national leader in the concierge DPC movement since 2007. Dr. Whitney served on the board of directors of the American Academy of Private Physicians from 2007 to 2013 and was vice president 2012 to 2013. He is currently on the Speaker's Bureau of the Dale Dunneen Method of Heart Attack and Stroke Prevention, the program at the core of the RSH approach. Now, please enjoy this interview with Dr. Charles Whitney. Hey, Chip, welcome to the show. Excellent. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. I'm so excited to talk today with you about Alzheimer's disease and, and especially oral health and the implications there, as well as some exciting work that you're doing with your, your, your program at Revolutionary Health Services. But before we do that, let's, let's step back and perhaps take a moment and tell us a little bit about how you came to be interested in such a fascinating area. It's been a fun road. So I, I've always had the DNA of prevention. I mean, that's just kind of some, some physicians are wired to be wanting to, to ask the question why and on everything they talk about and, and, and prevent or get to the root causes. That's always been part of me from the time I was in the Air Force and I volunteered for this big put prevention into practice program. So, but, uh, but so that's always been in my DNA. So about 10 years ago, I discovered this fabulous heart attack and stroke prevention program that I've implemented and has been wonderfully successful. So when I read and heard about Dr. Bredesen and his, his first book, End of Alzheimer's, and I read it, not only did I say, yeah, this makes total sense. I've been watching this in cardiovascular for years, but basically I, I said, I know this is going to work. This is intuitively makes sense. And oh, by the way, there's a physician out there who's talking about oral bacteria. In addition to me, I thought I was the only crazy physician out there talking about oral health because we're just not taught that. And it's not crazy that I, when I will talk a lot more about it today, but when I first had my aha moment and I realized how important the mouth was for preventing cancer, heart disease, and dementia, that I read, why have I not thought or heard about this before? And I sat back and said, well, you know what? In four years of medical school and three years of residency, I remembered one lecture, first year of medical school in anatomy, where we kind of learned the anatomy of the mouth, and that was it. We just passed the baton over to the dentist, anything in front of the back of the throat. And I realized in, in more recent years, that is a very bad approach. So yeah, so then basically I've been speaking to dentists around the country for the last several years. And long story short, got plugged into Dr. Bredesen and uh, it really brought to life what he first mentioned in his first book about the importance of the, the mouth in terms of both prevent, reversing and as this summit's talking about preventing Alzheimer's disease. That, that's, I'm so excited to hear about that. The, so before we talk about specifically the, the oral health and its implications with Alzheimer's disease, Let's step back and um, perhaps you could tell me, how do, how do you think of Alzheimer's disease? What, what is it? Alzheimer's disease, I used to think of it as deadly. It was a terminal disease. Uh, most doctors still think it's a terminal disease. There's actually the gene test, the APOE4 gene test that uh, Dr. Bredesen recommends in everybody. And I do recommend in everybody. Now, I didn't order it in everybody for years. It's part of heart attack and stroke prevention also, but I didn't order it because I thought that 
I mean, it would create too much anxiety if people learned, stumbled upon the fact that better risk for Alzheimer's disease also, and they would create so much anxiety, wondering if every little senior moment was the path to Alzheimer's. So I, I actually avoided that. And I kind of tiptoed around the discussion because I didn't frankly think there was anything to do about it and assumed that maybe what I was doing with heart attack and stroke prevention was also going to prevent Alzheimer's. And to a degree, it's true, but there's a lot of differences. So... So that's kind of that, that I've now totally changed my tune. And I know it's, I mean, I, I believe in, in I, I hesitate to say 100% on anything, but I think it's virtually 100% preventable in anybody, even if you're dealt a bad gene pool. I think it's 100% preventable if you just do the right thing and act now. And I encourage all of my patients is to prevent the untreatable because it's the biochemistry of Alzheimer's disease begins about 20 years before the symptoms begin. So the time to begin is now, the time to begin is yesterday and, and really as early as possible. And, and even if you're a parent of young children, and let's just say, you know, you've got some genetic risk to, to kind of get your children groomed into preventing Alzheimer's. This is, I mean, this isn't going to just help yourself. This is going to help your, your it'll be your legacy. So yeah, so so Alzheimer's big picture, yeah, it's very preventable, and there's a lot of root causes to it. And the other aspect is you don't have to be perfect, especially if we're in the prevention mode. That I kind of in my patients, I put somebody on the one, the three, or the five-year plan uh, of prevention, meaning that if you have cognitive decline, it kind of is a full court press. So you need a full reverse cognitive decline program, but if you're in the prevention mode, it really can be a three, five year plan and it doesn't have to be done all at once. We find, I, I do the full assessment and I say, what's most important, what's easiest, what's the person's level of motivation and putting those three points together, craft a plan with them as to What's our first phase of what we're going to do with this? So the more motivated they are, the more they'll they'll do. The more urgent it is, the more they'll do. And then, but but yeah, it just it's really it's a, it's really a precision medicine approach to Alzheimer's because there are so many moving parts as people are learning in the summit. Yeah, it's it, it's a fascinating fascinating disease. And as you as you mentioned, um, it is untreatable at least with conventional you know, FDA approved drugs and all. And I always wonder what is it about Alzheimer's that has resisted, you know, some of the greatest minds in healthcare and science with essentially unlimited financial resources over the last 30 years to come up with any sort of drug that has any meaningful effect on the symptoms of, of this disease. One of the aspects of uh, Dr. Bredesen's approach is that it's, it makes sense that it's the reason drugs don't work is because drugs affect one or two root causes of Alzheimer's and you're never going to get ahead of that. Even that latest drug that came out in 2021, that was 50 some thousand dollars a year and doesn't do any better than the last drug that came out 20 years ago. Cause we who understand realize that the approach to pharmaceuticals is about finding the magic bullet that's going to cure the one problem and medical research revolves one variable but unfortunately, with Alzheimer's disease, it's approaching a multitude of variables and, uh, and shutting the doors to, and then shifting the scales from neuron growth, I mean, neuron death to neuron growth. And the sooner you begin, the better. Yeah, it's, it's, it's almost like, like you say, getting to the root cause. It's like uh, with people with a, acute myocardial infarction, a heart attack. You know, back in the day, they used to be managed, treated with um, basically put in an intensive care unit, given um, and it, being kept out of arrhythmias and uh, given painkillers and basically supported. And then there was a revolution and they said, well, no, we need to re resupply the heart with blood. And then there was there were all these treatments about stenting and coronary artery bypass graft. And that was sort of the treatment for a heart attack then rather than just passively waiting. But of course, now we know that those really are only treatments of the secondary cause and the root cause of the heart attack, as as you were going to talk about later in the disease has has things to do with lifestyle and diet and things that aren't easily addressed it's with inflammation. 
it's inflammation. And inflammation. Just like, yeah. just, that's the root cause of uh, really most chronic disease, frankly. It's inflammation causing cancer, inflammation causing dementia, uh, inflammation firing up the artery wall and triggering a heart attack and stroke. And 50% of sudden death from heart attack and stroke is their first symptom ever of cardiovascular disease. So just like my mantra is, we've got to prevent the untreatable on all of them, the untreatable cancers, the uh, the dementia and uh, the cardiac cardi heart attack and stroke to prevent the untreatable. So that's, yeah. And, and inflammation, you don't treat with a pill. I mean, you, you inflammation is important, but you got to find the root causes. And that's why I say, we just got to keep asking the question why. And that's, and the nice thing for people is there's a lot of overlap. So what I yeah. do is I find out where a person's risk lies, either their worry or their family history or their personal history, and then take them down the path of cancer prevention to heart attack and stroke prevention or what we're talking about today in dementia prevention. So, so what you're saying is that um, this root cause inflammation uh, at the root of Alzheimer's disease is also at the root of stroke and heart attack and, and many cancers. And yeah. that the, the same prevention, when you prevent your Alzheimer's disease, you'll also be preventing your heart attack and these other things by addressing the inflammation. And there's wow. a lot of critical differences there, between the three different approaches. Sure. There's a lot of critical differences, um, but there is a lot of overlap too. Yeah, the, I mean, the oral bacteria we're gonna talk about today drives an inflammation in the artery wall, it drives an inflammation in the brain. And when those bugs get into certain organs like the pancreas, it drives cancers too. So. But yeah, so it's it's the digging in and finding out what this it's precision medicine. It's the what's the root cause of the inflammation. It's not treating inflammation with a pill. I actually had a great conversation with the University of Pennsylvania cardiologist who's well respected since retired, and I meant I was seeing querying how much he understood about the inflammatory cause of heart attacks and strokes. And he goes, yeah you know what, that's true. I, I understand that the, that's what the, the data show, this one biomarker I look at for that. He goes, but you know what, they, 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 they developed, they, they've done, a, they did a really nice study that came out last year where they, they developed this pharmaceutical drug to address that inflammation. And, uh, and it didn't seem to make any good, do any good reduce the inflammation from that drug. And I, and I said, I didn't hear about that study, but I'm glad for it because it's true. You're not going to get ahead of inflammation unless you address the root cause of the inflammation. So it was actually kind of a fun, enlightening story from this Penn cardiologist that, that recognizing that with inflammation, you're not going to get ahead of inflammation by tr giving you a pill. I mean, frankly, if you don't get rid of this, the inflammation from oral bacteria, it's like playing whack-a-mole. You know, you know what whack-a-mole is? Sure. You know the game that it's at the at the beach at the arcades. They they where you whack the mole and whatever that pops out of all the different th things and you yes. hit the mole on the head. Well, that's kind of like life. Is that yeah. if you maybe whack the inflammation over here uh, and then, but that's going to pop up over here and it's going to pop up down here and it just it I inflammation is the root cause of I believe almost all chronic disease. And that's why we have to get into the root cause so we can treat one root by, and will we'll impact all areas where those, those moles go. And so inflammation, I mean, one of the things I know that uh, Dr. Bredesen in his uh, protocol uses uh, fasting and uh, limited fasting and a ketogenic diet. Do you find that useful to dial down inflammation as well to switch it's, it's one of many tools in the toolbox. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, fasting is, is arguably one of the more effective ways. And actually, I, I, more so than, than inflammation, fasting works on, on the genetic, on the nucleus of our cells, and it actually improves the genes, and it, and it shifts more from, it turns on those genes in our gene pool that are young and healthy. I call them the young genes, where they've done actually studies where they look clusters of these young genes that are active when we're young and they turn off when we're old. And we look at the old genes that are quiet and inactive when we're young and they turn on when we get old. We obviously don't want that from occurring. And one of the interventions for turning on the good genes and turning off the bad genes is fasting. So it actually really impacts signaling on a cellular level 
it's a fountain of youth. I mean, think about it. We've yeah. all been looking for the fountain of youth. And from it, on a genetic level, that's one of several interventions that will help to uh, turn on the young genes and turn off the old genes. So Yeah, there, there's so much going on along that line, like you say, in anti-aging or the longevity space with nutrient sensing master genes and proteins like mTOR and AMP kinase. Yeah. And they're... I, I agree with you. There's not a drug for this, but uh, what do you think? It's healthy lifestyles. It's one that yeah. we talk about, where it is literally on a genetic level, we found the fountain of youth. I mean, I've got a, I, a, a I, website I, that talks about turning on the old genes and turning uh, turning on the young yeah. genes and turning off the old genes. Yeah, autophagy and all. But I'm just wondering, because one of our, a couple of our other speakers have talked about this, is uh, uh, rapamycin is a drug that turns down mTOR and uh, people have talked about using that for Alzheimer's disease as well as you know age suppression and everything. It's, a, it's an off-label use and that, that, do you have any thoughts on that? Or? I mean, uh, generally as people are learning, the Alzheimer's prevention and reversal isn't as much about pharmaceuticals as it is about finding and choosing those important and easy lifestyles to adjust. Like I mean, quite frankly, doing some fasting, once your body gets used to it, I mean, it's actually, it's 1230 here. And I had a bar at uh, uh, 12, I had a bar at 10 o'clock. I haven't eaten since about seven o'clock last night. And I didn't like that at first, but I've adjusted to it. It's not a big deal anymore. But I mean, getting to the pharmaceuticals, yeah, I, I believe it. I'm not real familiar with that one, uh, but it's, uh, I believe that there are pharmaceuticals that might be able to help out if, especially if we're working on a, a gene activity level. But again, it's, a lot of these things that we've been hearing about and for the listeners i just want to inspire you that think of it as an anti-aging forget about what you're going to do preventing your alzheimer's 20 years from now that quite frankly it's i think it's a way to anti-aging i mean honestly i'm 57 and i feel and look think younger than i did at 39 when i was 40 pounds heavier and a lot less healthy and and i think that it's there it it's i mean talk just as far as the healthy lifestyles and genes turning on and off, your skin. I mean, we, we talk about people all getting all the Botox and all these interventions for their skin. If you can just get the turn off the sources of inflammation, your skin's going to get tighter. You're going to get less bags under your eyes. And, and, and just from a pure aesthetic standpoint, if you want to get motivated on aesthetics, a lot of these healthy lifestyles, quite frankly, are going to help you on an aesthetic level and also help prevent heart attack, stroke, and cancer. Yeah, yeah, it, it's amazing. And yeah, I want to underscore that that lifestyle is really the, the, the way to go to here. We're hearing that. I just raised that one drug just yeah. as an experimental thing. But lifestyle is great because it changes the way we live uh, and and it doesn't cost anything. And actually, if you're doing what you're doing in fasting, you even save money. You didn't spend money on breakfast, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and in, and in, uh, and in today's and world with inflation, we need to curb our food costs. So uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Actually, it's, funny, it's funny that I've, I've thought about that with the, the recent inflation we've seen in 2021, that actually, then maybe that'll help actually drive a financial drive to reducing portion sizes. So because uh, we can cut our food bill in half if we eat half as much food. So hey, you know, whatever it takes. So there's different yeah, motivations I, for different people, but uh, in the end, it prevents the untreatable. And it, it makes that, I mean, I, I, I've got a patient named George. He's 97 years old now and been a patient for about 25 years. And this guy's great. He have a guy, uh, I made a video, a cartoon video of him where, I mean, this guy at 97, he's, he's had his bumps in the road, but frankly, he's a 97 I want to be. Like he cuts his lawn. It's kind of like a walker going behind him to stabilize him. He, <laughs> he, he went to the gym before the pandemic. He he works as an architect still. Like I mean, he's now like I think he's at 15, 20 hours a week and he drives. And I don't think he's had any accident. He drives to New York four hours away from here to his cottage every summer two or three times. He's he's living. I mean, that we can the most important is not how long we live. Longevity is nice, but we want to have that quality and we want to have our health span match our lifespan. Unfortunately, if our life ends here. Many people, their health ends here. And what we want to do is we want to bring those together so our health span ends almost simultaneous with when our life ends. So that's that's a big part of it. That's kind of what we all get worried about with aging. What's, that, what's it going to look like in those last few years? And 
everything that we're talking about just makes sets you up for being like George at 97 years old. Yeah, that's that's an inspiring thought. Well, like you, when I went to medical school, I, and I learned that brushing your teeth was to prevent cavities or dental caries, and th that's all changed now. So let's let's dive into that a little bit. <laughs> yeah. So so what you're asking is how does a family physician from Washington Crossing, Pennsylvania, speak nationally to the dental dental uh, professionals out there. So as I told you, 10 years ago, I implemented this heart attack and stroke program. And I sent a lot of work up to the Cleveland Clinic. They're like the best in cardiovascular prevention and the big center part of this program. And there are several biomarkers of inflammation that indicate inflammation active in the artery wall. And there's especially two biomarkers that if one of the, if they're high, it means you have active plaque somewhere, somewhere. Which are those two, just for our technical listeners? Uh, myeloperoxidase. Okay. <laughs> and LPPLA2 for the scientists okay. out there, lipo, uh, lipoprotein phospholipase A2. So okay. it's a cool. plaque two for that nickname. Cool. But basically, okay. they, if, if either of these two are, are high, it means active plaque. So, uh, so when I first implemented the program, 2011, I did what doctors do. I gave them statin drugs, said, lose weight and exercise. So after six months, a lot of these people with these high plaque two biomarkers, they were losing weight, they were exercising, I had them inspired and they were on statins and this, this number wasn't budging. And, uh, it was like, I mean, let's just say that it was a different scale then, but let's just say normal is under 180. They were routinely running 350 to 450 on this number. So they were high, they were budging, they weren't dropping more than 10 or 30 points with these things. So I pulled out my training slides and there was a few, just a few slides at that point about oral health. And so I simply said, brush your teeth with a sonic, with an ultra, or a, a sonic brush, um, the vibrating kind, not the spinning kind. Uh, use Listerine mouth rinse. Now there's more refined recommendations and go see your hygienist. And I'm not kidding. And people were plummeting left and right, 10 to 30 points with the statin and, and weight loss and exercise. Routinely 50 to 150 points, they were plummeting when I just said those three simple rudimentary physician recommendations. And I'm like, what is going on here? This is just crazy. I mean, this is, this is not, the, this is indicating inflammation specific in the arteries, putting at less risk of heart attack and stroke. Well, then I sat back and I had an aha moment. We all have these aha moments in life. And I said, okay, wait a minute now. All right. So what we're doing, I know for years we were taught in medical school that if somebody has a disease heart valve, that if they get the bacteria from the mouth, in infecting that heart valve, that's a very bad thing. So we pre-medicate with antibiotics if they have a diseased heart valve. Well, why is that? That's because bacteria from the mouth are getting into the valve. Okay, well, then I, we all know, or I, I knew, I even knew at this point that every time we chew an apple, bacteria from them, if you've got inflamed, infected gums, those bacteria get into the bloodstream. So I said, okay, wait a minute. I know that those bacteria can infect a disease valve. What else do they do? And I was like, oh, well, oh, okay, I get it. So those bacteria, and I'm not kidding, they literally, and the physicians and the dentists and health coaches who get trained in recode learn that they get into the wall of the arteries everywhere and they fire up and flame those artery walls and they can trigger heart attack and stroke. There was one study back in uh, uh, 2013 published in Circulation, the Journal of the American Heart Association. This isn't any dental journal. This is a cardiology journal, one of the top two in the country that showed that up to 50% of these 101 heart attacks they looked at were triggered possibly from bacteria from the mouth, triggering a vulnerable artery to burst heart attack and they, they, they literally sucked the blood out of a clotted artery in the heart for their catheterizations analyzed them and they found enough to say up to half of those heart attacks may have been triggered bacteria in the mouth and now we know that the bacteria from the mouth get into the brain of alzheimer's patients high levels of those bacteria are found in the brains of alzheimer's patients when they studied them at autopsy and we they similar things when it gets into the organs some like like a pancreatic cancer is the one that's most associated that that basically that 
bacteria of the mouth, especially P. gingivalis, one that a lot of people may have heard of. That's the, really the bad bug of all of the bad bugs, that when it gets into the pancreas, it has a potential for triggering an inflammation that makes a person at risk of developing pancreatic cancer. And that's one of the untreated and almost everybody untreatable cancers that we have to prevent. So, so uh, yeah, so that's uh, that. So when I, when I had that aha moment and I said, oh, what else are those bacteria doing when they get into the bloodstream? It just opened up a whole new world and long story short, it kind of opened up some opportunities to go around the country and inspire dentists to uh, assume their role as a health professional. We all know about dietitians and personal trainers and physicians and chiropractors and all, there's a lot of, health professionals at the table of prevention. Well, my inspirational talking to these folks is please assume your rightful spot at the table of prevention because in some ways they're more important than a lot of them. So, and a lot have, and a lot have, and actually Dr. Bredis opened up uh, certification, his certification for dentists. So dentists can actually are now getting certified in his recode, pre-code approach. So I do, I'm encouraging people to, it's the very early stages as of the fall of 2021, but basically finding out dentists who really understand the mouth body connection. And especially if you can find one in your area who's been certified in Dr. Bredesen's approach. And, and yeah, so, so this peach and Javalis is really the bad one. Um, there are several, there, that's, I would say yeah. there's one above all of the others. That's, uh, that's the worst one of the bunch. Is there, is there a way to, we just talked to Neil Nathan about screening for mycotoxins and mold in, in the urine. Is there a similar assay for P. gingivalis and other bad actors that are worthwhile doing in yes. patients for prevention? Yes, so there are saliva tests that originally were developed for dentists that basically associate, they, were, they, they did a saliva test where they can look for the DNA evidence of, so they're looking for the DNA, bacterial, not human DNA. It's not like 23 to me, but it's looking for the DNA of bacteria of, there's really, I mean, there's really main five bugs out there that are really the important ones. And there's one test that's a saliva test that looked at 11 different bacteria linked to systemic disease. Uh, and uh, that basically they, they can look at it, we can see what's in there. So basically giving the dentist a target of treatment and giving a, a, we physicians, I mean, I order it in my practice and we're starting to get physicians trained in ordering, doing oral health in their practices. Some do, some don't. It's not uh, that, that basically we're, we're evolving the recode, pre-code approach, but basically doing saliva testing to see do you have to get P. gingivalis next to zero and a couple of the others out there also um, for the medical people listening out there, spirochetes are, are a bad one. Lyme disease is a spirochete like Neil Nathan would be talking about in toxicity. Uh, well, another very important spirochete family is in the mouth and that, so that's that one. And then some others also are out there. So, but basically, you know, that, and there's an overlap of uh, these same bacteria are the ones that cause periodontal disease. I mean, periodontal disease, we think of as an inflammatory disease of the mouth. Gingivitis is a mild form of periodontal disease, a more significant one, but basically their inflammation caused by infection by these bacteria and potentially other organisms. So yeah, so we there, yes, you can, there are ways to find that out and pa patients can't go there directly, but through physicians or dentists who order them that we can, we can get them for you. And you mentioned the key things just to underscore, they should use a sonic model toothbrush with vibrating bristles, not rotating. Um, and yeah, there, there's, there's several actually, those were my beginning ones that I okay. just say, well, let's just keep it simple. Okay. And actually uh, on the sonic brush, there are different brands. I mean, Philips, Oral-B, I think others, they, it, it's a technology where they, they vibrate. So that the bristles, instead of swirling to swoop it out. So, mm -hmm. so basically the, the brush even done perfectly, uh, perfect technique gets them out only a certain level and the, and, and the spinning brushes will swoop it out to the end of the bristles. What these sonic brushes do is they're able to break up those film of bacteria. That's what we're doing when we're brushing and we're flossing is that we're trying to break up those film of bacteria that, that kind of traps those bugs in there to basically break them out of their biofilm it's called. So what the sonic brushes do is they, they basically vibrate to the point where they're actually able to get about two to three millimeters beyond the tip of the bristles and break up those biofilm further than the tips of the bristles can reach. 
And I've had wow. several dentists tell me that I, I say to them in, a, when I kind of in my learning process to say, if you could pick one intervention, because there's so many things that they can do for their mouth, one intervention, what would it be? And they say, get a sonic brush, that's easy. So that's, that's clearly the common denominator is, is a sonic brush where they vibrate. And, and some people don't like the vibrations and that's probably because you've got issues. So it's probably because it's irritating nerves to the point where you need to get a dental team to help you out in terms of reducing the irritation and the nerve effect from this enough to be able to tolerate a brush. So that's, so that, that's one thing. Um, I mean, categories of things that people can be thinking about and they'll probably find their dentist and in increasingly physicians talking about mouth rinses. So I, I, Listerine was my original one and it's a good one. Uh, I like the alcohol-free one now because there's some negative effects that the alcohol can have in other ways in the mouth. But, but basically that helps to kill a lot of the bad bacteria in the mouth. Another one, I, I mean, the two I recommend most and I'm not sponsored by them is uh, Closest. There's another one, Closer. So that's another one that they, and they actually work together nicely to, uh, to kill the different bacteria bacteria involved. They actually, they, they complement each other nicely to get all the different bacteria. And so I typically say use Listerine after brushing in the morning, use closest after brushing at nighttime and take it from there. So uh, people who are well-read will say there's a negative, potentially a negative impact of mouth rinses on the biome, the bacteria of the mouth. It's theoretically true, but honestly, in my mind and the physicians who talk about this, Honestly, I don't think I understand the oral bacteria component of it, that I think in most people, you're, it's more important to get your biome healthy in your mouth and worry about the potential negative effect of the mouth rinses. And once you've got a healthy mouth, then not as much or not use the mouth rinses anymore. Does that yeah. make sense? You try yeah, yeah, that's good. And in addition to brushing water picks, are those, uh, those yeah, of value? Yeah. So yeah, so yeah, that's another aspect of things is that uh, using the water, they'll, they'll, they'll help to kind of break, again, breaking up the biofilm is typically what they're doing. It's interesting, I've got a handout I give people that I got from a periodontist, a gum specialist down in Philadelphia. He's actually on the board of examiners for the national organization who train periodontists. He actually has a handout, can I borrow that? Because I think the patients are gonna think I'm nuts if I say this, but he actually recommends people put in like the basin of the, the water pick, putting like a half a teaspoon of Clorox bleach. Yeah, good, huh. old, good old bleach in the but like a half a tablet. He said, it's like pool water, it's an antiseptic. And it actually will help to kill those bacteria at the base of those pockets and obviously spit it out and don't swallow the chlorine. And we who do toxicity also have to be cautious about the chemicals that they're getting with that. But just in general, he finds that those things are really good. And especially if you put a little antiseptic in there. So, but again, this is where I get my one disclaimer to all of my patients, to all of you listening, talk to your dental team. I mean, me as a physician, I, I know enough to be dangerous. I know way more than most physicians do. And I can have helped out a lot of people, but ultimately they know the mouth way better than I do. They're, they're the mouth experts and whatever they tell you is, is more important. A, a dentist who understands the infectious nature of it and how the impacts of overall body health, complete health dentists are called or biologic dentists or just somebody who talks about that, who does pocket testing in your mouth where they look for the depths of those pockets because when they do those little probes that measure how deep your pockets are, what they're doing is they're looking for damage from these bacteria. That's kind of ultimately what those pockets are from. The, the, uh, some people I hear say that, oh yeah, my dentist says I've got receding gums. Well, that's not a normal process. Receding gums is because you generally got inflammation that's damaging your gums and they're receding because of an infectious process going on in your mouth. So, uh, but yeah, yeah, it's just when it comes to all these recommendations, ultimately talk to your dental teams because they understand. And I guess one of the categories that we've talked about, the one I, there's a couple others to touch on that they might hear about is probiotics oral probiotics. Those are, uh, uh, we hear about probiotics for our gut. That's a big discussion. Well, there are, we want to create a healthy biome, a healthy environment for our mouth. So we want a healthy mix of good bacteria, eliminating the bad ones that we've discussed. And we want to have an acid-free mouth and there's ways they can do that. Um, and most importantly, these bad bacteria also are acidic and these bad like P. gingivalis, they create acid in the mouth 
that creates a bad environment to grow more bugs. They want acid. That's that's the environment they love. They love doing, and they'll grow better in that. So if we can create a nice balanced environment through back good bacteria and neutral pH, it does that. And then there's other things like xylitol. If you heard of xylitol, we they put it in gum, but that's tiny amount in that case. But xylitol will actually help to create a healthy bacteria environment. So these are these are ways that other than like direct mouth rinses and breaking up the biofilm that people can do. And they may just hear about that, but yeah, whatever the dentist is recommending for the, all of that, people don't often understand why, but well, the big why of what they're talking about is gum health. I mean, like you said at the beginning that we all think that we're gonna prevent cavities. Well, it's a lot easier to prevent cavities than to heal diseased gums. <laughs> and in most cases, and this is kind of, uh, um, a little too simplistic, but yeah, in most cases, if you're creating a healthy gum environment, you're likely not going to get many or any cavities at all because it's again, it's bacteria breaking down the enamel and it causes tooth decay. So if you're if it's it's a bacterial source in most cases of tooth decay. I mean, there's other things like acid reflux breaking. There, there's other causes also, but it's the bacteria is a big component. Of it. So yeah. That's, that's one of the big three categories of where people can help their dementia risk by taking care of their mouth is keeping a nice, healthy biome like people have heard about with the gut. Same discussion front. This is the gut. This is the beginning of the gut. The gut extends from the mouth to the butt. So, but just unfortunately, most of us forget that this is the first part of the intestinal tract. So, so healthy organisms is key that's the first one for alzheimer's prevention as well as all these other diseases that you've mentioned so yeah. let's let's touch on the other two as well the the second one maybe go to to mercury now and, and talk about that a little bit what's yeah. what's the what's the latest so as people who learn about dr bredesen's very organized approach one of the big six categories of Alzheimer's disease is toxicities, whether it's oral bacteria that falls into the category of toxicities because it is a toxin getting into the brain and it drives cardiovascular disease. That's another one of the six. It gets, as I mentioned, gets into the artery wall. Well, there's a whole host of other toxins we talk about, but one of the neurotoxic um, toxicities is mercury. So the big sources of mercury are organic mercury, living mercury in fish. That's not this topic we're talking about, but then there is the mercury that's historically put in mercury amalgams, the fillings. So if you've got, if you look in your mouth and you've got silver in there, you're at potential risk for memory problems because there is mercury in there. And keep in mind, if you've got caps, you don't, not necessarily all the caps have mercury underneath it, but I've learned from my dentist friends that some caps are, some mercury is hidden underneath the caps. And sometimes that's tough to find out, but generally there's ways they can figure that out. But anyway, so the mercury topic in general, this is an important one. So, because if somebody has Alzheimer's disease or a mild cognitive impairment, we want to eliminate all the root causes. Well, if you've got silver in your mouth, there may, I emphasize may, be a problem going on you may need to have them taken out so so uh so that's just the main big picture concept about mercury so when i say that at first to dentists they say oh, actually let's talk i've heard about uh the different so first of all is prevention that's what we're talking about here i will say no matter what your dentist says don't let anyone put mer more mercury in your mouth the american dentist that don't allow any more mercury to be put in the mouth. Unfortunately, I, with all due respect to the ADA, they still say it's okay to put mercury in the mouth because they've not found significant evidence to suggest that it gets out in their system. The problem is that most mercury testing is terrible about picking up mercury adequately. So bottom line is I wouldn't let any more mercury go in your mouth. There's, 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 reasonably inexpensive ways to get it in there. And if and I would recommend getting non-mercury fillings put in if you need any more fillings and don't let them put any mercury fillings in your kids. So uh, anyway, so that's, the, that's prevention when it comes to mercury. And then what if you have silver in your mouth? Well, the first step 
is to go to your dentist. So when I talk to dentists about this, they start to cringe when they hear this physician talking about mercury, thinking that I want every single amalgam taken out of their mouth. Because what the dentists know is that most mercury exposure is when the fillings go in. So that's when you, it, you it get a whole bunch of mercury exposure at that time. And then the second most important time is when they come out. So there's a lot of mercury that you get exposed to when the, when the fillings come out. So therefore, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Mantra or the, that, that approach is that if it's not causing any problems, they don't necessarily need to come out. So that's why the dentists tend to cringe when they hear me start talking. Well, the nice thing is, is that, that we've kind of come up with algorithms for the dentists and the, the, the physicians of giving an idea, kind of getting a lot of the heads who understand this together and kind of guidelines for the dentist of what to do is to discuss. So the first thing is that the dentist says that your filling is broken down and needs to come out, it needs to come out because it's probably releasing mercury into your system. So, so that's one guideline is, and the dentist will all agree with this. If it's a broken amalgam, it really needs to be taken out safely. That's beyond this discussion, but it needs to be done safely. And, uh, and because you wanna minimize more mercury exposure in your world, especially if you've got risk of dementia. So, but what if the dentist says that it, it's, it's fine. Uh, you leave it alone. I don't think you should have this taken out. It looks like it's a healthy filling. Well, that uh, there's a Dr. Chris Shade, who's a PhD scientist, who's done a lot of looks at this and, and uh, has developed a great test for testing out uh, levels of mercury, both fish version and amalgam version, but basically saying that, that we can identify if you have mercury in your system. Basically, it's a, it's a three-part test where we test hair, we test um, urine, and we test blood and put the numbers together to say, do you have significant fish organic mercury? Do you have significant inorganic mercury, which typically is from mercury fillings if you weren't a chemist playing with mercury in the labs or broke out broke open thermometers when you were a kid who used to have mercury thermometers. So those could be the sources, but that's inorganic mercury. And then it says, how well is your body detoxifying from these, uh, from these exposures? So it really helps identify. And, and if you've got significantly high levels of mercury showing up in your hair, urine, and blood, well, then we need to really consider taking, out, taking them out safely. Um, uh, even if they think they're good repair, it, it appears that they're they're getting out of love. So at the recommendation now is to consider having them taken out if you've got significant exposure um, to it. So that's just, that's kind of the 20,000 foot view to a very complicated topic. So, but no more mercury, get them out if they're broken, get them out if they're showing up in your system, which dentists can't unfortunately order right now, but we're teaming up physicians and dentists and other, other uh, dementia pro professionals and dentists to be able to order the test, hoping to get them to be able to do it at the dentist's office too. Uh, and then if you're taken out, take them out safely. So those, those are the, really the three talking points behind Mercury. Oh, great, great. And then um, it's great there's a test for it, at least they can do. And, and those are great guidelines for the prevention as well going forward. And then the last- that, That's yeah. kind of, it's also oversimplifying it. That's how I've done it. So, like with this one test, but there's other ways that if, like if a physician, there's other ways of testing also that, that physicians may do, but just basically good mercury testing if, if you have amalgams. And then, and then the, last, the last oral condition that contributes to Alzheimer's disease that we need to be aware of for prevention. What airway. is that? It's airway. You notice I didn't say sleep apnea. So... So when I say sleep apnea, people start cringe and many people have been pushed back about getting tested for it because they picture themselves with CPAP uh, on their face and they, they get claustrophobic and they really just don't think they're gonna be able to tolerate that. So in my lectures I've been giving to dentists for the last few years, I've been privy to a lot of sleep dentistry lectures because they've been pairing me up with that. And it's been really educational for me. And now when I teach the physicians the oral health component of, of reversing cognitive decline, I, I start off by introducing, I say, okay, to the physicians out there, sleep apnea is not a lack of CPAP. Because quite frankly, that's what we're taught. <laughs> we're taught to throw some oxygen on there and it's just like giving a person a pill, except it's a very big uncomfortable pill. That sometimes is necessary. If you've got severe sleep apnea, 
okay, where you're dropping off your oxygen level, you may need CPAP for a while to bridge the gap until you cure your problem. But it's it's like putting a Band-Aid on a wound. It's giving you a, a Motrin for a, a fever or headache is that you're treating, you're putting a Band-Aid on a wound making yourself feel better or getting oxygen to where you need it in the short term with CPAP, but it's not fixing the problem. Sleep apnea is in, in virtually everybody is an airway problem. So it's, a, it's the oxygen not getting from point A to point B where it's needed while we're sleeping. And it's, it's crazy how much out there can be done. So um, the, 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 the couple, I mean, pe most people say, say they, okay, yes, yeah, so you mean I need to lose weight? And I say, yes, yes, well, being obese and, and having a very, a lot of fat tissue accumulating through is one method of obstructing the airway. And, there, and most everybody who loses, who needs to and loses weight will improve at least their sleep apnea. But now that I know with heart attack, stroke and dementia prevention that I found a lot of skinny people with airway problems. And I think Dr. Saunders, who talks a lot about this, he does the, the lectures with the, uh, to, in the sleep, the airway part with me about sleep apnea, he, he emphasizes start talking, start dealing with this in kids. And those have been some of the most super interesting that when our, when our skulls are most plastic is when we form our airways. And a lot of our airway problems goes back to when we were born and not through any fault of our parents, but there's this, uh, you can watch his for the details, but a lot of you out there have airway problems that we can, that, that were from the day that you were born, I mean, that, that will uh, cause an airway to be obstructed. So again, skinny people can have sleep apnea too. And you don't have to necessarily be snoring much. There are plenty of silent apnics out there. You don't have to have your spouse see you stop breathing to have sleep apnea because they sleep too. So it doesn't necessarily, they might miss a lot of your apnea, which tends to be at the dead of night when both of you were sleeping. And uh, so there's an airway problem. And the only way to do it is to test for it. And then the nice thing with the testing ability is that for pretty inexpensive, we can test you at home. For we can do sleep apnea testing at home and, and, and then real, you don't have to go to a sleep lab anymore. So, but anyway, so it's an airway problem. And there is so much that the dentists can do for who do sleep. I mean, there are dentists who have set the, who all they do is airway dentistry. I mean, they, 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 somebody else does the regular dentistry in their practice and they do airway dentistry. They're so passionate about it because people feel better. I've seen before and after pictures on how they look. I mean, it's a source of inflammation. I've seen pictures where the bags under their eyes go away. <laughs> I know that that's a form of aesthetics. You sleep, treat your airway to get rid of the bags under your eyes and you don't need Botox, you don't need plastic surgery. The creams don't work all that great that you can sleep, treat, treat your sleep apnea and you'll look better. And, and, and it really is amazing when I watch these lectures and the before and after, because quite frankly, some of the dentists who do this inspire people to act through the way they can look better. I mean, it, cha it changes their facial structure, Ron. It does, it, it changes, they, it, it, it kind of spreads out the face. It makes it not quite as tall. And it's just, it kind of, it, it really, it, by opening the airway, it kind of restructures some of the, um, some of the facial bones. And so I don't fully understand it, but it restructures things so that it creates a better airway. It can double the space that needs to get through from the mouth into their lungs, just through interventions, through orthodontics. There's a, there's a very cool appliance out there now where it's almost like those palate expanders you see on the inside where it can, it kind of opens things up and, and it kind of creates more space for the oxygen to get through. And where they, even if they need some bridge CPAP at the beginning or don't need it, they can put it on the shelf and cure their sleep apnea by opening the airway. Wow, and so this can be diagnosed with a take-home test. Is it like a blood oxygenation? Uh, yeah, well, the one I use, there are different ones out there. The one I use, sure. a, it's, a, it's a little finger monitor to, to monitor their oxygen level and other things. There's a little piece that sticks up in the top of their chest to measure their cardiac rhythm and the variability and all that. And then there is a like an oversized Apple Watch to uh, it measures things on their wrist. So there, there's it used to be like the one I used to use have this thing that strapped to their forehead. It was pretty uncomfortable and they couldn't sleep normally. Uh -huh. The ones are, are are super comfortable and easy, and they just they just upload the data to a smartphone the next morning. The one I had, so it's it's super easy. I mean, they literally they take and then. And then they, uh, they can do kind of one to three days of testing um, with whatever 
get crab stuff together and they just and it's throw away. So there's really no returning. It's, it's super easy these days in the comfort of their own home. It doesn't give them the EEG part. So sometimes they do need to have observed sleep studies, but that's the vast minority these days with technology the way it is. Almost everybody can do a home sleep monitor. Wow, that, that's great. Well, what I'd like to do if we have time is uh, you've You've done some amazing things by taking all this information and this technology and, and treating not only preventing and treating Alzheimer's disease, but also heart disease, stroke, and the risk for all these chronic diseases. And you've put it together in an amazing program through revolutionary health services. And maybe you could speak a little bit about, about that and what's, what's available to, to people in that program. So... Prevention is my DNA. So when I, I plugged in a great heart and stroke prevention, preventing that first heart attack. And when I met Dr. Bredesen's program, I incorporated pre-code, which is probably why people are watching this, prevent cognitive decline. I rolled in the best of of his. And then through my approach to cancer prevention is identifying the toxicities out there, improving detoxification, uh, all different toxicities out there, and roll that as a cancer cancer prevention, and then basically create what I call health compass to 100. So it's kind of a root cause functional medicine approach to preventing the big three things that bring people down in life. I asked a number of years ago, I asked people, what do you envision life when you're old? Well, basically they were saying, George, who I talked about earlier, where they wanted a healthy brain, they want to be active as they want to be, and they want to be independent. Well, those are the three big diseases that steal our independence, our brain, and our activity level. And uh, so I created this program I call Health Compass to 100. It's your roadmap to that 100th birthday, not just longevity. Longevity programs tend to focus on one, maybe so one route. We kind of look at all the important root causes, like I said, where I and my team of medical providers, we will find out where's their genetics, take them. Where's their worry and where's their family history and kind of plug them into one or more of those three things. And we kind of focus in on one of those areas that are most important to them, cardiovascular dementia or cancer prevention. And that health compass why is your roadmap to that hundredth birthday, whatever 90th birthday that you imagine when you get old. This guy, George, I'm not even sure at 97, he thinks he's all that old. So at 57, I like to think that I'm not old when I was getting married. I thought I, my mother was old when she turned 50. Now 50s are not old anymore. So anyway, that's that's just kind of the, the approach that we do. So yeah, we do the full recode program too, which is a full court press deep dive year long plus program to immerse people into the full Bredesen protocol. But then for the majority of people, it's more of the uh, prevention mode of preventing those three things. Uh, and, and, and it actually is, is printing, you know, we may be focusing on one because it's more important for this person. As you said, you're preventing all three of them. That's what we do. Yeah, and this program, I understand you have a version of it that's available uh, remotely. So people don't necessarily have to be where you are geographically. So people can go to your yeah. website and sign up for it. And Yeah, yeah, I was doing that with telemedicine before people knew, before Zoom came a verb. I was using Zoom before <laughs> Zoom became a verb. Uh -huh. Zoom things and now we Zoom things. So it's, uh, but yeah, no, it's, it's so much a telemedicine uh, and so much of medicine now that we've got such great technology can be done afar. So what we do is we ask people to come in for their first visit where we do all the data acquisition. We do blood work, urine, whatever we have to do, saliva testing to, uh, to do whatever we do in person. And then follow-up visit can be done via telemedicine from wherever, homework or whatever. So, and then most cases follow-up can be also. And we set up because we are getting increasingly people from out of town coming in. Uh, we're setting it up to be able to do it so we don't have people don't have to choose us. I mean, we're a, for people who are local, we have a uh, kind of a full spectrum direct primary care family practice also, but because of prevention is a lot of times, I mean, I, I can't press on your belly from afar, but we, we work with people on, on, on what they want to do. Well, as an expert in preventing not only Alzheimer's disease, but cardiovascular disease and cancer, I'm curious what lifestyle choices, if you, if you wouldn't mind sharing with us that, that you, that you do for yourself. <laughs> so 
you're getting into my uh, my story. So <laughs> in case you didn't realize I got a secret, doctors are people too. You're imperfect <laughs> and quite frankly, some of the most unhealthy people out there are doctors and nurses. We tend to preach well and not practice what we preach as much. So I was there too. So my, my aha moment with myself was when I was at the beach with my four-year-old son, who is now 19, and I was with my father, and he snapped the grandfather picture, sent them to me, and I said, oh, who's that fat guy? Oh, it's me. <laughs> it was an eye-opener. The mirror was lying to me. And so, yeah, in the first six months, I dropped about 25 pounds by just kind of doing those basic things that I knew, but it was, it was, that was 15 years ago and it's not been all at once and even to this day I keep implementing more and more and more and, and as I learn more I mean I've incorporated fasting and then my, my most recent one that I didn't believe it was that it was exercising in a fasting state I won't get into the science but that's actually a really healthy habit is to actually when you're at, when you're fasting doing exercise but uh so i was skeptical but it, but when i started having more energy with my workouts in a fasting state it's like oh gosh these people were right when they lectured to me on fasting and exercise states so the one i haven't done yet is those ice plunges i i hate the cold and i've not adopted that one yet I'll, I'll full disclosure but you know i mean in all sincerity it's and actually one quickie is that it's it, it's an investment but organic food from a toxicity discussion. I mean, being getting those pesticides out of your fruits, vegetables, and grains, and, and really shifting over to a lot of uh, uh, organic foods is, is, I think that's a key to reducing inflammation because those are toxicities I think that other days. So that just that alone, I mean, I'll use my wife as an example that after about a year or two of uh, shifting over to mostly organic in our family, I just dawned on me, it's like, I used to give her antibiotic once or twice a year for a sinus infection. And she used to constantly complain about the goop in the back of her throat. And I got to thinking, wait a minute, I don't remember the last time I gave you antibiotics for a sinus infection and you don't talk much about the goop in the back of your throat anymore. Well, I think it wasn't just the head and neck that I, I think it was gut health. Gut health plays a lot into things. And that's a different discussion for a different day, but I just, just so sort of, that's just one little, so, so it's, it's again getting back to the my world it's, it, it's not been perfection a hamburger is not going to kill you uh i'm i i will have my enjoyment foods but it's not lifestyle it's not about again one night one hamburger is not going to kill you but a hamburger every day well that's a different story you don't have to be perfect it's about like dr bredesen discusses with uh, alzheimer's disease you don't need perfection you just need to tip the scales from neuron death to neuron growth and bingo you're you're there and uh so that's why it's and, and it's enjoyable i feel better i sleep better i just uh, i think i look better and and so it's uh it's it's, it's doable and, and when you start early like this group is listening is is uh is looking at prevention i'll, I'll end where i finished the biochemistry of alzheimer's disease begins 20 years before the symptoms start so the time to begin is yesterday and there's all these other side benefits of your efforts too yeah, that, that's great. How can people follow you, Chip, on social media? Um, I, we're going to put in the show notes all the links to your websites, but and, but perhaps you could just tell us for the some of our audience will be listening to this uh, and let them know the best way to get in, yeah, get in so, touch with so what you're doing. On a business level, I haven't ramped up aggressive stress social media, but we have a website, a, a, a Facebook page, Revolutionary Health Services. Uh, that's my practice, Revolutionary Health Services. I love the name, 20 years old, but I still love the name. Uh, I'm in Washington Crossing, Pennsylvania. We're Washington Cross the Delaware. So it's, we're in a revolutionary geography too. So, but that's what we do is it's all revolutionary. But yeah, Revolutionary Health Services. And uh, it's, the website is RHS Live Well. Revolutionary Health Services, RHS Live Well. And that's where we are. That's the website. And there's contact us and, and phone number and all that. Great. Well, Chip, thanks. Thanks so much for spending the time with us today. I, I loved hearing about the, the great work you're doing. And I just want to thank you so much for, for being with us on this program. Uh, it's my, my pleasure, Rob. And that, that 
Honestly, we want to inspire people, and I, I, I totally appreciate what you do, getting out to the masses, just showing everybody what's possible. I mean, it's possible. It's not just work doing this lifestyle thing we're talking about. There are short-term and real big-time long-term benefits. No, this is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking of it because of something you have seen here. If you find this to be of value of you, please hit that like button and subscribe to support the work we do on this channel. Also, we take your suggestions and advice very seriously. Please let us know what you'd like to see on this channel. Thanks for watching and we we'll hope to see you next time!